All right, let's get started back up. I'm going to bring up Jessica. Hello. Hi, how are you? Great. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jessica, the product and project manager for the Rest Foundry team at Azavia and plays a role as an internal cheerleader for increasing Azavia's portfolio of environmental and climate resilience work. Um, it's also Jessica's first uh, Foster G ever. So welcome. And I'm really looking forward to your talk. So take it from here. Great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, first, I just want to say that I really enjoyed JP's talk. If you're in uh, on this stage just a minute ago, uh, I think there's a lot of similarity between what he was talking about in last mile delivery and what I'm going to talk about. Um, but uh, as we all know, climate change is a global crisis. I think Rob's presentation earlier this morning was a sobering reminder of that. But as they say, all politics are local. Climate change affects both people and planet, and our actions need to protect and preserve both at a local, national, and global level. In many communities, there are just simply not enough of the right resources to design and implement those actions. That's why I revised the name of this session, which was originally Get Closer to the Action, to Get Closer to the Action Takers, because so much of what I'm gonna talk about in the next 20 minutes is about the people on the ground in the city manager's office, the emergency response office, or just the people that have, uh, you know, <laughs> the burden and the benefit and the, and the privilege of having to do this work. Those are the people that we need to help and support. And the White House has recognized this. They're calling for a government-wide response and encouraging everyone from all sectors to come to the table. And in this session, I hope to provide you with some concrete ways in which you can join that effort. So just a second about why this is not going to be a normal Phosphor G presentation. <laughs> So first of all, I'm a product and project manager. I'm not a developer. So take everything that I say with a big grain of salt. <laughs> Second, uh, most of my suggestions are US based because that's my experience and that's what I know. And I certainly don't know every tool and app or data set that's out there. Uh, if you have one that you think is relevant to the audience, the audience groups that I'm talking about, please let me know. My contact information is on the last slide. I would love to hear from you. I also recognize that you all have day jobs and I hope healthy boundaries. <laughs> there are plenty of opportunities to help and I'm providing just a limited number of suggestions to help get you thinking about ways that might work best for you and your life. So just a second about my company. Azavia is a small geospatial firm uh, in Philadelphia. We, our mission is to advance the state of the art in geospatial technology and apply it for civic, social, and environmental impact. We're also a certified B Corp. Uh, I joined in 2017 and was charged with getting our research grant to make climate change data more accessible back on track. And ever since that time, I've been the internal cheerleader, as Rob said, for tipping the scales of our mission statement more towards environmental impact. So in that first project that I came on to write, we started by ingesting all of the NASA Next GDP, which is Global Daily Downscale, Downscaled Projection Data, and built a US-focused API that made querying the incredibly hard to wrangle net CDF data by location and time frame really easy. I tried shopping it around to small and mid-sized communities, which were the audiences that we were targeting, and I got very little interest. They all told me, I don't know what an API is and I can't use one. So next we added a simple GUI for creating customizable graphs. And I went out again and I started talking to people and I got a lukewarm response. But everything we, with everything we built, I heard the same refrain. Well, this makes the data easy to visualize and I can put it in a report, but what do I do then? For the communities that I talk to then and now, Access to the data is not enough. So we teamed up with a domain expert called ICLE, Governments for Sustainability, that already had a emissions inventory tool called ClearPath. And we built a decision support tool designed to help users look at the data as part of the bigger process of creating a vulnerability assessment. We also tried to surface the most important hazards to look at for any given region based on the national climate assessment so that people didn't need to look at all potential hazards that might befall their communities, but could focus on the ones that were potentially the most critical. I tell you this story to illustrate how important it was critical for me to build a network of subject matter experts and on the ground practitioners. 
And right now, most of them have a great deal of hope that the current administration's focus on adaptation and resilience will unlock new potentials for their communities. And there's good reason to have hope. There are a lot of organizations and initiatives that have been providing hope in their own ways. Uh, some of, our, some of you are here now. Some of you are the host. <laughs> there are lots of organizations that are doing this. Data and Services for Social Impact, which is broader than climate resilience, I know, uh, is a pretty crowded space and has been for a while. And that's a good thing. However, the issue of too much data and not enough direction or not enough insight, as JP was talking about, is so prevalent that the federal government is convening people to discuss and problem solve. For example, I recently participated in a roundtable discussion hosted by NOAA and CODE, the Center for Open Data Enterprise. Participants from the public and private sectors and every federal agency with an acronym talked about the challenges that vulnerable communities face when trying to use data for climate risk assessment. The resulting recommendations, which you see here, revolve around standards creation and partnerships, especially public and private partnerships, but it all boils down to making it easier for communities to leverage and transform data into actions. Access to data is only part of the problem. Implementing actions is the key hurdle. A climate action plan that sits on the shelf is barely worth the paper that it's printed on. When I reached out to my network and told them I was doing this talk, and I asked for examples of open source applications or software developers working with communities that weren't on staff, obviously, I got a ton of responses. And they were all about open data sets or open source dashboards for public communication about the potential uh, for urban heat or uh, flooding. All of those things are great, but I got no examples of open source tools being used by local communities to make decisions. And if you're in this session and know of an example, please share it with the whole group. I am anxious to find them. <laughs> I believe that there's a huge opportunity for all of you to lend your skills and expertise to your own communities in ways that will help them become more resilient by partnering with them directly. They don't need to drown in any more data. As JP was just saying, sometimes they don't have the data, but that data exists. But what they really need is ways to extract insights and make plans. It won't necessarily be easy, but it will be so much more valuable to the community at large. There are literally hundreds of data sets, JP just listed a bunch of them, for visualizing future climate conditions and current climate conditions. So my first piece of advice is don't build any new tools unless you know it will solve at least one community's specific problem. Know for sure, meaning you have talked to them. <laughs> now, before you do this, you'll likely need to build some domain knowledge. There are tons of ways to do that and to become something of a subject matter expert, which will make you and your technical skills even more valuable to these community partners. So here are just a few examples. Climate.gov tries to put together some of the more robust resources and organize them in one site. One of the main sites they point to is the Climate Resilience Toolkit and the Climate Explorer within that toolkit. In the Explorer, you can choose any location and see the temperature and precipitation projections through 2100 and explore the five steps to resilience, which are which are basically is the guidance that these communities have to follow in order to get to climate change adaptation plans. Then there's something like PREP, the Partnership for Resilience and Preparedness. They host hundreds of international data sets that you can select and visualize right on their platform. But what I like about PREP is that you can actually create your own dashboard. You can pick and choose the data sets that are most relevant for you and the hazards that are most relevant for you and put them together in a dashboard. So this one is Sonoma County's just as an example, but it's a really powerful way to put all of the information that's most salient to you together in a very visual format. I think it's really accessible. It's come to the point that there are so many data sets and tools that the federal government and other organizations have created clearing houses and curated selection tools by topic, geographic region, intended audience, you name it. But we don't necessarily need more tools. It's the ability to use them to inform actions that we need to enhance. So my second piece of advice, 
What we need is more local application of the data and tools available to us currently. In order to achieve that, I encourage you to find your practitioner partners. It can be on the local level, the regional level, the national level, or the international level. Just find someone who is on the ground doing the work and talk to them. You'll probably need to do some searching just to uh, educate yourself a little bit. And there are tons of ways that you can find what's going on in your community. What hazards are facing your location? You can use any of the sites that I just listed. There are a ton of others. Uh, what is your state doing about it? Uh, I'm here in Pennsylvania and it's under our Department of Environmental Protection. We do have a climate action plan. Some states like California have copious resources and tools and have made a good deal of investment in making sure that they communicate to the public about the dangers of climate change and what they're doing to mitigate and adapt. Get to know the players. Has your city or town signed on to the global covenant of mayors? Are you part of the urban sustainability directors uh, network? Are you part of ICLEI? Do you have a resilience officer or a sustainability officer? Who's taking the lead? Is there a government agency? Is there a, a university, a local think tank? Is there a progressive funder that's in incentivizing local climate action? Survey the landscape and get to know what's happening in your area. And talk to your friends and your family, especially if you have children. Climate change is transgenerational and widespread climate education is a key component of this long haul. Here are some easy ways to get involved if you're not quite ready to send cold emails to your sustainability officer or someone in your city manager's office. <laughs> They're relatively comfortable. You can be on the lookout for the Opportunity Project or TOP. It's a program of the census and it organizes uh, 12 week sprints. I'm currently serving as a product advisor on a TOP sprint, which is all about helping communities find and apply federal climate data to their resilience efforts. What I like about it is that it's a facilitated process that puts technical teams in direct contact with practitioners and gives you the freedom to create your own output, provided it uses federal climate data sets. It's also worth mentioning that TOP is currently running the Open Data for Good Grand Challenge, which offers up to $210,000 in cash to products and tools that solve public problems, specifically in this round around climate change. Uh, one of the eligibility requirements is that you met with potential users and stakeholders before building anything. And whatever you built was released basically in the pandemic years, 2020 and 2021. And if that's not quite your, uh, your jam, there are nonprofits like Datakind, which are constantly on the lookout for data scientists and engineers to help the communities that they partner with on the projects that the communities themselves design. Check out their site. They're always looking for volunteers. Then there's Justice 40. This is a relatively uh, new organization. It was created by the Biden administration's executive order in January, and it stipulates that 40% of all relevant federal funding, think HUD, FEMA, that sort of thing, goes to the most vulnerable communities. They are looking for supporters, as you can see on the lower left now, but before you blow up their inboxes and I get angry emails from them, I should note that they haven't specifically asked for engineers yet. They're looking for people with uh, grant writing experience and capacity building experience. However, if I can see the writing on the wall, I'd be shocked if asking for engineers is not on the horizon. So I think when they're ready, uh, if you make yourself known, they will take you up on it. Even better, not tied to anybody else's 12 week, week sprint or anybody else's uh, campaigns, find your local regional integrated science and assessment center or RESA. It's a program of NOAA um, and these centers are housed in universities and they serve as regional networking organizations that connect science and research to local communities. So they really try to make this applied research. I've worked with a number of them and they're fantastic. They're usually the go-to resource for those municipalities and states that don't have strong climate action plans. If you're able to volunteer any of your time and knowledge, they will be able to match you with a community that would be happy to have your help. If you have more of a research bent, you can reach out to your local university 
and inquire as to who's working in this area. Here in Philadelphia, we have two great examples. So the first of which is UPenn's Masters of Urban Spatial Analytics. They have a practicum for their about to graduate students that pairs students with city agencies and organizations throughout the country. Uh, sometimes they're about transportation planning and urban planning, but sometimes they're also about climate resilience. That's been a really successful program. And we also have at Drexel University, the Sustainable Water Research Engineering Laboratory. I happen to work with some of their faculty and they're currently working on creating a community-based stormwater management opportunity uh, program. Basically, it will be a mobile app where they will tell communities that are about to experience heavy rainfall that there are certain storm drains that need to be cleared. And so it's working with the community to uh, basically clear those drains right before rain and improve the performance efficiency of the stormwater infrastructure. And it's uh, in pilots has been proven to increase uh, proficiency of at least 50 to 70 percent. So it's a really uh, it's a really good community based tool. So all of the researchers that I've worked with, and I'm sure uh, most of the ones that you've worked with, would love to take advantage of the skill sets that you all have to help apply their work to real world situations. If your expertise is more financial in nature, consider looking at the Linux Foundation's effort. They have something called Hyperledger, which is looking to create standards for accounting to help us manage our global carbon budget and explore how to use digital technologies like blockchain, open source software, AI, IoT, big data, machine learning, anything that's sexy and hot, uh, to create transparent climate accounting systems. Basically, how do you get all of the financial institutions to use one standard accounting system so that we can actually figure out what's going on and where action needs to be taken and would be most effective? They also have OS Climate, which is hoping to leverage open source technologies to create a platform to increase our global investment in mitigation and resilience technologies and strategies. Some of the biggest banks and investment firms in the world are currently taking part because they've recognized the need to grapple with climate change's impact on our historical economies and practices. Now, these are just some examples of ways to get involved. And if you don't see one that suits you, and I mean this genuinely, please let me know. I will do my best to help you find something that's a little more up your alley. And I mean that genuinely, I do want to help. Most importantly, my third recommendation, every single person I reached out to, and that was not a small number, somewhere between 25 and 30, said the same thing. You have to talk to users in order to build something valuable for them. They have limited resources and collectively we have limited time to act. Like Rob said this morning, our 1.5 warming scenario, we're probably already there and we need to act fast. Don't waste another minute on building something you hope but don't know for sure will be useful. You need to conduct user and stakeholder research and craft solutions that work just for them. If you're already building something, go the extra mile to make it easy to interpret. These folks are already doing 10 jobs. Don't give them something new to learn. Give them solutions that they can use now. And if you already have an application or a tool, talk to your users. How can you make it easier for them to make decisions and accelerate our action planning? I'll just give you one example. One of those RISAs that I work with, it's called SKIP. They're in the Southern US and they put together this guide, which they call the simple planning tool. It's not really a planning tool. It's a curated list of data sets with historic and projected information specific to Oklahoma. It's a compilation tool to help decision makers use other data tools. But the process that they went through was the important part. They started with informal conversations, which turned into workshops with more than 70 emergency managers and city planners, which led to some user basic, uh, sorry, some basic user interface testing. And this co-creation and consensus building made all the difference, especially to Oklahomans. You all are powerful, very powerful bunch, natural problem solvers looking to make a difference. What I'm telling you is that the way to have an impact as the world around us changes is to solve specific problems. It requires more time and energy to figure out what those are, no doubt, but there are no shortcuts to any place worth going. And the world in which we are all using our unique talents and skills to improve our communities 
is definitely a place worth going. So this may sound super daunting and like I'm asking for an inordinate amount of your time, but climate adaptation solutions are out there. There are known. There are cities and counties and whole countries that are implementing effective strategies and have things to say about it and lessons to share. There is hope. More and more attention is being paid to climate change now, and it's about time. We're real late to the party. You may have heard that NOAA will be launching a Climate Smart Communities initiative to train an army of planners and scale up resilience planning in all of our communities. That gives me hope that we can have a really significant impact. And as with any movement, all it takes is dedicated people that remain hopeful that they can change the world. If you can't tell, I'm one of those people and I hope you'll join me in whatever way you can. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. An awesome, an awesome uh, message of hope. And I think, um, yeah, a, a important reminder that, you know, in, a, in addition to building out foundational tools that make it easier to access geospatial data and apply them, do analytics on them. Um, the real work is in partnering with practitioners, like you're saying, and finding the, their specific problems because tools are just tools. And if they're not solving anybody's problem, then then what are we doing? <laughs> what are we they're doing? They're just toys. <laughs> they're just toys, exactly, exactly. So yeah, really appreciate it. Uh, the, the one question um, is just some praise for the talk. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that they would love uh, to get the slides um, as a follow-up. Yeah, I will be uploading my slides right after this. <laughs> awesome. Well, if there's no other uh, questions, um, I'll just thank you again. And I uh, hope you have a rest of your, uh, good rest of your Foster G, first Foster G. Um, and so we'll be back uh, in about eight minutes, uh, give a little break, and then come back with um, an interview with uh, Hamid Alahamad uh, from Reading Earth. Thanks. <laughs>